make sure you click the link to subscribe to my YouTube channel and also click the notifications button to be notified for when my next podcast goes live. You can also follow me on my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest is. I hope you enjoy this week's episode. Thank you. Boom, we're on. Hi. And today's guest, we've got the beautiful Helen Wood. How are we? I'm all right, thanks. First of all, thanks for coming on. Thank you. Oh, you're a busy girl. I am, but making time for you, James. I know, it's standard, isn't it? Procedure now. <laughs> <laughs> so, how's life? Um, it's all right, yeah, it's good. New book coming out? Yep. Man's World? Yep. It's a man's world? Well, no, it's called Just a Man's World, but um, it sounds very man-bashing, but it's it's not. It's just man bashing people that need to be bashed. Certain individuals. Certain individuals, yeah. I'm not a man hater by any means, but this book is about wanker men. I'm surprised I'm not in it. <laughs> is, uh, There's going to be a sequel. <laughs> a better behaviour today then. So I always go back to the start with my guests. Find out a bit about you, where you grew up, and how you get involved in the life you were involved in. So, Bolton Girl. How was your life brought up, getting raised? Um, well, I came from the very stereotypical Catholic background where everyone thinks everything's hunky-dory because you live in the nice house, your parents have got, well, my dad had a good job and all the rest of it, but it was all kind of smoke and mirrors. It wasn't like that at all. It was a very miserable existence. I didn't really have a childhood. None, n- neither of us did, like me or my brothers it was just a house that we kind of lived in and listened to just non-stop shit and arguing and fighting um yeah not not so great really but it has its plus sides because I've kind of learned what not to do what not to do with my own child so yeah it wasn't great but lots of people have shit childhoods and yeah I was just one of them yeah, I think the majority of people, have, we have tough upbringings. I put a post on actually earlier in the week just to say that I understand people have shit upbringings, but there comes a time in your life when you need to take the range yourself, take, responsibility, take yeah. responsibility, and if you want a better life, then you need to... Go out and get it yourself. Yeah, go out and get it, which is difficult. A lot of people don't have that luxury of getting the luck to maybe change their mindset and believe that they can, but anybody can. You were I in, think they can, You yeah. were in foster home? Yeah, yeah. I went into foster care. What um, age? I was about 15 when I went into foster care. Um, I actually, um, when I got when I got told by, I'm still friends with the social worker that put me in care, um, and she came to tell me that it was a vicar, and I think she was head of head of English, the uh, the lady, and I was like, you can get to fuck, like I'm not going in, like that was my worst nightmare. And then when I went in there with the um, when I moved in, they were just like the nicest, most amazing people. Um, so yeah, I had I actually had a great time there for all the wrong reasons. I completely like abused the trust and stuff like that. But they were lovely people. They were probably the first two adults that I'd ever met in my life that actually spoke to me. They didn't speak at me, and that was really strange. That was kind of weird for me to get my head around at first, you know, that these two grown-ups were so nice. Did you have a lot of trust issues then for people when they were being nice? Did you think they wanted something or do you think, why are they being nice? Did you yeah. question it a lot? Yeah, I kind of, I've, I, I kind of, still, I'm still like that now. That, that's something that I'm still working on, even at this age, is when people are very, very nice to me, I always think, this is a bit weird. Like, have they got a hidden agenda? Like, why should I trust them? I have got trust issues. I've still got trust issues. I've still got the same trust issues that I had from being a child. I don't know whether that'll ever change because I'm a lot older now and I still don't really trust anybody. How old? So, (laughs) fuck off. (laughs) Fucking 36, you cheeky bastard. I said to him, (laughs) for those watching, I said, how old do you think I am? And he said 36, so... I almost left. (laughs) I was only kidding. I'm a joker, fuck's sake. Is there... 
So obviously, but again, the trust issues and stuff can also be a reflection of yourself. Mm. It can also mean that everything is a sign. So when you're feeling some sort of way, it can be because that's the way you are as well. So maybe you've done a lot of wrong deeds to think. Like, I have, yeah. Do you know what I mean? I have. And that's where the insecurities come, the trust issues and all the bullshit of the day. Because I'm the same, I'm the same boat as well. I wouldn't well. say that I've done, the only thing that I've ever done wrong, that, well, not, I've done lots of things wrong, but when it comes to people trusting me, I'd like to, I'd like to think people could trust me. Strangers, strangers couldn't trust me years ago because of what I used to do. I used to sleep with people's husbands for a living. So I understand that. But my friends, I know that I'm a good friend. So I can't, like, obviously I'm not trying to, like, say that I'm white than white. I'm absolutely not. But I've got trust issues because obviously I know that a lot of men go out and do whatever they do behind the wives' backs and stuff like that. And... Not uh, all men. Not all men. I had this argument on Twitter last night. Some toss to change my words. I said, most men are wankers. And some guy put, you cannot tar all men with the same brush. I just said, you just swapped my fucking word most. Most for all. I didn't I didn't say that. There's loads of nice guys. But I was like, there's horrible girls. I'm not saying that like all women are innocent. It was some women are awful. And, you know, that... They've, they're just as snaky as a lot of men and, and things like that. So I'm not kind of... Yeah, again, but I believe the, the, the better person you become, the better person you attract. The more yeah. you change, then your mindset starts changing also. And no matter what in life, there's good or bad everywhere, no matter who you are, no matter what age, no I've matter noticed sex that as I've, as I've got older, um, I used to attract a lot of toxic people. As much as I had like the same like best friend... I did used to attract a lot of shitty men and like shitty people in general. And as I've got older, I have noticed that I very, very quickly cut off from like a bad, I hate the like phrase bad energy and stuff, but it, it is a thing. There is such a thing as a bad energy. Of course it is. And when you, when I, as soon as I pick up on that, I'm very like cutthroat with it. Mm. As much as people think I'm rude with it, if I see something bad or see just a tiny bit of something that I think that's not right, nine times out of ten I'm right and they do turn out to be a person that yeah. I wouldn't really want to be around. But that's your gut feeling and your yeah. gut's connected to your brain. That's why it's your second brain, so you get that gut feeling. That's why when people don't use their intuition and gut feeling, they know, majority of people know the answer straight away, but mm. they ride with it because they think, what if? Instead of yeah, going with your feeling. No. And you'll get your energy vampires. If you've got good energy, you'll get those fuckers who come up and talk to you. And as soon as they bastards leave, you're fucking drained because mm. they've just stole your energy. Mm. I get it's it. true. Isn't it, Stephen? I feel it with Stephen. <laughs> 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 uh, so obviously, the the Foster kind of stuff, how did you end up in Foster? If you had, was it a... I just had a really turmoil relationship with my dad. Like, um, I, I didn't have a good relationship with my mum. But my dad really found it very difficult that I was the dumbass of the family. I wasn't academic whatsoever. I wasn't necessarily a very pretty child. And he used to really kind of make me feel very small in that way. Like, any way he could make me feel small, he did. And it, then it started getting physical, like I'd I'd end up hitting him back. As I got older, I started fighting back and hitting him back and things like that. And I started running away. Um, and I think he just got pissed off with the embarrassment of, um, you know, he had this image to maintain. And yet he had this delinquent, as he used to call me all the time, like child that would run away all the time and this tear away. So eventually it was just easier for him to say, like you're going into care. And when social services did come to tell me that they'd signed me off into care, like they told me thinking that I'd be upset. They were like, you know, we have got some news for you, blah, blah, blah. And I was buzzing. I was like, I wouldn't have been going home anyway. If you'd have put, if you'd have sent me back there, I'd have just fucked off again. Was there a lot of violence towards you from yeah. your dad? Yeah, my dad kind of saw me. Says, my, I must, I've, I've got to point out that although I'm not a believer in the whole, you know, um, I think you should always break a circle. I don't understand adults who don't break a circle when they have kids. It doesn't make any sense to me. Being a mother, I'd, I've never understood that. But my dad came from a really, really abusive childhood. 
where he his sisters were treated like like absolute princesses. They had everything that they wanted. And my dad and his brothers were really, really badly um, physically and mentally abused um, by both sets of parents. And I genuinely believe that I was the scapegoat for my dad and his release yeah. in this anger that he he's kind of he continued to feel um as he got older and and then I didn't turn out clever and things like that, which he hated. He despised the fact that I couldn't do things um academically. And yeah, he was just everything was just always my fault. Like if me and my brothers were fighting like normal siblings, it was me that got leathered. They never did. And like or my mum and dad would my mum and dad would argue and I remember once I was in I, I had like a high bed and he him and my mum were arguing. I was asleep and he came in my bedroom and just literally grabbed my head from off the bed and dragged me off the bed like by my skull while I was still asleep because he was arguing with my mum and it was like I was the easy target. Do you ever yeah. look at it, the fact that your dad actually seen himself and you because of everything he went through? Absolutely, that's what, I, that's what I'm saying. I think he... Uh, I think it was his way of dealing with it. Yeah. Um, it's, it can be co it's mother image as well. It can be conditioned. It can be in your DNA. It can pass down from generation to generation. Yeah. A lot of people not understand it, but to forgive also is a way to heal and move on. Because I, and I, when the majority of people I speak to, they've got a lot of hurt and pain, and I always say you need to forgive that person because if you don't, they go oh, fuck that, that's not. That, but they're holding on to that anxiety. I don't. Feel, it, it's strange. Like my friends of years that have kind of. They know what I've been through and stuff. I think it's very natural for a friend. I mean, I don't like, I can only speak for my group of friends, but I feel hurt when my, I feel more hurt when someone hurts my friend more than what they feel. And they feel that for me. So when I say anything about my dad, which is very, very rare, like I don't even really call him dad, I call him by his first name. That's when I talk about him, which is probably like every few, every few years. They speak really angrily about him. Whereas I don't feel that. Like he jogged past me last year on the reservoir. I was walking the dog and he jogged past me. I've not seen him for five or six years. And when I went to my grandma's funeral a few years ago, he was there and his new wife came over to me and was like, um, your dad really misses you. And I said, with all due respect, like you have no idea who I am and you've no idea like what's happened. Like just leave it at that. And she was like, but he wants to talk to you. I said, well, you know, he's the big boy. He can come and fucking talk to me. Like, just leave it. But I, I don't want him to talk to me. Like, I don't feel an, any anger there, but I don't want any relationship there whatsoever. I've always just seen it as, I don't even regard myself as ever ever having parents because for me, <clears throat> like, being a parent, like, I'd like to think my son looks at me and thinks if he's upset, if he was scared, if he needed something, anything, his first part of call would be to go to me. I never, ever felt like that about my parents. So I've never really, I've always thought of myself as a one-man band. I've never, and that was from being like a teenager, like I was paying bills and going shopping and stuff whilst I was in my uniform because I had my own place. They gave me a council house when I, while I was still at school. So I've never really seen myself as, has, as having parents. See, if you reached out to your dad, do you think you would speak to him or would you just try and cut it off straight away? Oh, there's just nothing there. It's not even a... I don't mean this in an arsy way towards you, but like it's not even a question worth asking. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't. It doesn't bother me not speaking to him whatsoever. I don't think you're put on the earth. Like, yeah, they put you on the earth and whatever, but it's not the be all and end all. If you don't have, to. I am not one of these people who is like life's too short. Shall you make amends? I'm more like life's too short. Fuck off. Yeah, if people are stealing your energy, if people are making you feel weak, or down then cut them off no matter if it's your mum your dad your best yeah. friends um because life is too short and you must yeah live it to your best possibilities and a lot of people will always go back which is difficult no but i think it's the worst thing you can do like for me as a like my son could never do any wrong i'm so proud of him like for everything that he's done even if he wasn't academically bright like he's your child like he's my child he's everything and now as an adult I kind of look at how my parents were and I think, how the fuck did you mess up so bad? Like, why were you such, you know, crap people around kids and why did you not set this example and why did you not, I don't know, why, just, I think it's just so important to let a kid know that they're protected and 
that they have someone there that you know for them to turn to and that's why i just think what's the point in what would be the, be the point in ever talking to them ever again well i talked to my mom I, I, my mom was on the receiving end of a shit marriage she wasn't an angel it wasn't like all oh, my dad's fault but um they made the absolute stupid like mistake of oh we're catholics so we can't divorce they needed the, uh, the the priest didn't approve of them getting divorced, which just fucks me right off. Like, I can't stand anything to do with religion. Yeah, religion divides the it world. It absolutely pisses me off how people can, you know, the, the corrupt, the, how corrupt that is, that they basically said, this is how I see it. So a priest doesn't approve of our divorce. But yet, so fuck. we're going to put our fucking kids through hell until they leave home or until one of them runs away. Like, one of my... I can't really go into detail about, like, obviously my brothers and stuff, but we've all been messed up in our own way, and that's due to our parents. I'm probably the one that's come out better, like, because I feel like I'm a lot more confident and I've bounced back from it, whereas my brothers haven't done that. They've really suffered socially, like... Addictive. Yeah. Which is difficult, and I think a lot of people growing up in broken homes... They tend to go down the drug route because it numbs oh, the God, brain. Oh, God, no, sorry. I've just worded that wrong. I oh, didn't sorry. hear that. No, no. They... No, I'm just in general. Yeah, people that as well, homes. yeah. And obviously, when you came out all that, you, what age did you fall pregnant? I was, I actually got pregnant in the vicar's house. Wasn't the so vicar, was, like, was it? <laughs> don't say that. No, he was lovely. No, um, I was 16 when I got pregnant, so... um. But it was, I feel like everything happens for a reason. I'm a firm believer in that. I genuinely believe that had I not had my son, I don't know where, I don't even think I'd be a sat you know. I genuinely don't. I think I, I was so messed up mentally. I was so angry at the world. I hated everyone. And I don't know. I think I would have been seriously messed up. Like I'd have been seriously fucked up had I not had my child. Um, obviously things took a turn for the worst after I had him and stuff like a few years later. But I wasn't mentally messed up. Uh, like when I was a child being a teenager at a really vulnerable age, that's when I was the most like fucked. I was so damaged as a kid. Yeah, I wasn't a kid. I didn't I didn't feel like a child. Yeah. Do you think that's why you still act like a child then to bring back your It murder? is. <laughs> it actually is. That's why I'm so immature because when I was at school, I was such a pain in the ass. But... Same. It's because when I was at home, I wasn't a kid. So when I went to school, I just dicked around because I wasn't clever. So there was no point in learning. Well, I couldn't learn. I couldn't concentrate to save, like, to save my life. So. But do you think that concentration just, as well comes to all the anger and frustration, the fighting in a house that you couldn't concentrate on there because you're sitting so tense? So the time you came to school, you had to zone out because you were so fucking broken with trauma? I can't put it all down to that because I'm now... I'd say I'm a lot more content now and I still can't sit in a classroom. Like I would really love to go to uni, but I couldn't sit in a classroom because Why? I automatically want to disturb people. I love distracting people. I still love being the class clown. I like making people laugh. I just like being an idiot. I enjoy doing it. But the reason being, we spoke about the ayahuasca stuff the first night. I drank ayahuasca. For anybody who doesn't know ayahuasca, it's a plant medicine. You drink it, they say it reconnects you with your soul when you face all your fears and demons. The first night, they tell you, when you drink the ayahuasca, ask the cup who you've become. And I couldn't stop laughing. I got took outside because I couldn't stop laughing. But that was one of the first reasons, because I was a class clown. But for me, it was always trying to make people laugh. All I was doing was deflecting the way that was hurting and in pain. Mm -hmm. So for me, that was a mask always try to annoy people up because I'm thinking I'm too stupid yeah. here to do anything. So the mask came on and I made everyone laugh, but that is a sense of, yeah, you're hiding from it some is. sort of pain. And I don't think I'm hiding because I'm, I'm totally in the know with what's going on in my head. Like when I'm at home, um, oh God, like my anxiety levels when I'm at home, which people never ever see. Like if my son's not in, or, you know, and I'm in the house on my own. I don't mind my own company, but after a bit, when all my friends are really busy doing family stuff, and obviously I, I don't have that lifestyle, um, oh, my God, like, really, really, like, hits me. 
And that I, I do hit low points, like really, really low points where I really start to panic and I have to get out of the house because I do get frightened sometimes of some of the shit that goes through my head um, because I sometimes feel like I'm literally just on my own and that's it. And when you go through your phone book, I've only got like a few really, really good mates and I'll ring them and if they're busy and stuff, it kind of like dawns on me. I'm like, this is my life. My life is now looking after my mum and I just work and that's it. Not that there's anything wrong in that, that a lot of people live like that. But sometimes you, if you can't if you can't grip hold of what's going on in your head, it spirals out of control. And quite often it happens more as I'm getting older, really, which isn't great and something that I need to address and sort out. But going back to what you need what you were saying about like the the pissing around and you know being the class clown and stuff like that. Massively, I totally agree that that behavior is because of what's really, really deep, like going on deep down. It it definitely is. Um, but I don't know. It's just something that I have to work on myself. And I, I am working on that myself. Yeah, we'll like. be working on ourselves till the day we die. It's constant improvement. But as long as you can identify yeah. what's going on, you can, you can work on it because a lot of people are in denial. A lot of people don't want to admit they've got problems or insecurities or fear. Every single person on this planet has. But for me, it's the strongest people to go, wait it's a minute. It's weird, actually, say all that, what I've just said to you, I wouldn't actually sit down and say to any of my friends, but I'm sat here saying this, knowing that it's going to get brought. I'm good at my job. But when you actually speak to someone out the circle, like I was telling one of my clients the other day, she's going through loads of shit that I've been through, like with a boyfriend and stuff like that. And she really opened up to me. And her mum said to me, like, you know, she's not like, she won't say any of this to me. I said, because you love her. And like, it, it's difficult for someone to open up. I don't want to sit down with my... And, like, I'm sure you'll agree, like, as you get older and your friends are busy and stuff, like, when I'm feeling really shitty about life and I, I feel like I'm hitting rock bottom again or I feel so lonely, I don't want to go and say that to my friends. They're, they're busy. They've got shit going on. Like, my best friend's pregnant and, like, one of my other friends is always busy. My other friend has got a toddler and stuff like that. So you kind of just start to think... Just deal with it yourself. And I think that is a good thing. Like, And I thank God I do have the ability to deal with it myself. But some people don't have that ability and that's what's worrying. You need to be careful, though, feeling as if you're like a burden, phoning your friends with problems and issues. But you've probably done it your whole life. You've probably suppressed I the feelings. I escape. I, go out, yeah. I just go outside. As soon as I feel like that, mm -hmm. like, um, you don't like, want house, to like my house is a prison. I leave. Like I just go, I'll go and take the dog out and I'll go and sit somewhere or I'll read I, I'll like you know go on to like a life coaching thing I follow a couple of life coaches and like if I just hear something from a stranger like it's weird what it can do to yeah, you change your mindset just snap you back yeah. just snap you back quite quick and I am I am blessed in that way that I can quickly snap out of something as much as I can really start to feel very very shitty about things I can quickly like flip back yeah, and, but that's the past, thinking about the past, maybe thinking about all your shit. So that if living in the past will bring fear and anxiety. So if anybody that's in a struggle right now, read a book called The Power of Now. I don't think I live, it, I don't think I live in the past. I no, but the my, thoughts, the my, subconscious my, mind. Yeah, I think because of what's gone in the past, it's kind of, it's still continuing, like, and it's it's affecting, like, what's happening now, like, my issue with men, like, Obviously, I'm 32, 36. 36 so, Jim, for some. <laughs> um, so um, obviously, at this age, I should be dating and I should be doing things like that. I should go out for drinks with guys and whatever, but I can't do it. Like, I just find it impossible to do because I just think, oh, so I'll go for a drink with you. And then what happens then? They're going to find out who I am or like some some guys don't know who I am a lot of guys don't know who I am and then they find out and whatever so I just think what's the fucking point but that's you like, that's already at that you've already placed planted know, those seeds in your mind I know, so I know what that's I'm shit doing. you need to work on because I know. but then I'm scared of being like this age like in my head I'm just like do you know what I'll have a relationship when I'm a lot older because at the moment I can't 
I can't deal with the fact of, like that I might get with somebody and you know all relation all people argue in relationships and stuff and some twat turning around in the relationship and saying like oh well you used to do this that and the other because I would literally just be like fuck off mm -hmm. as soon as I hear them words like I've been on dates and stuff not very many, but like I went, <laughs> I went on one, and like he got pissed. We we're having a really good time. He brought up my past, and told me he told me he was okay with it. I was like, I didn't ask if you were all right with it. Like, what the fuck has he got to do with you? Yeah. I'm not asking him anything about his past. None of my business. Like, and I just thought, so you basically sat here taking me at like you're not taking me at face value. If, if I can't meet someone who can't take me at face value, then I'd rather die very, very, like, alone because I can't deal with that. Stop being so fucking grim. No, Fuck's I don't sake. mean in a grim way, but I couldn't have someone toss that in but my But you face. know yourself, if someone meets you, they're going to need to take on all your shit. Yeah, you don't, you're not on these, can't throw it in my face, Yeah, though. but people argue and fight. I'm sure you throw a lot of shit in people's face. So I wouldn't. I would never throw... I, no, I, I know, but a it's... in someone's face. It's difficult. So you're going to need to accept your past because you still don't accept that for I other do, people to accept that. I do accept my past. In a way, but I not don't, fully. I think, it's, I think it's wrong. for so. No, I don't have a problem with my past. I don't have a problem with what I used to do or anything. What I do have an issue with is that people, because I'm known in the public eye and whatever, it's like... It's like you almost become public property for them, you know. A character. They, they think that they have a right to, you know, I don't know, like they have, that they're entitled to say, yeah, I'm okay with you. And it's like, that's not really, that's not, <laughs> that's bollocks. Yeah, you're not fucking riddled with mad diseases and was if they're yeah, trying to accept like, you. But fucking hell, I'm not a paedophile. You... <laughs> like, I, was, I, I was like... Do you think though, but... Because people look at you, obviously, with your, the past career, do you think people try to feel as if you're an easy lay, try and shag you quicker? Yeah, massively. Treat you like shit? Massively. I think people are really, really shocked when, like, I'm actually really awkward around guys. If if I meet if I meet a really confident guy, I'm okay because they kind of take... Oh, thank you. Oh, fuck's sake. Thank you. Um, they kind of take first rain like kind of they take the reins on the like the whole situation and then it flows <laughs> and then it flows but i would never i don't know i am quite a, like my friends really take the piss out of how i am around guys like i'm really awkward um so yeah it's it's a tough that is a tough one um and they do think obviously that i'm an easy shag and whatever so I automatically, as much as I'd like to go out and have a one night stand sometimes, because you know it is normal for someone of my age to go out and have sex, but I don't really do that anymore. But I can't do it because I think they're doing. They think I'm doing this because I used to do that for a living. Mm. So that's in my head. So unless I meet like a really really chill guy, which isn't very often, um, I can't really go out and do that. Which I don't think there's anything wrong you in going have out. My number. <laughs> She has my number, Stephen, didn't she? <laughs> Don't here, give me all that part. My new, my, new booty, my new booty car. So, have you ever had therapy? Yeah. Many times. Uh, I went for like six sessions. It actually really did work. So I was really, really addicted to Zopiclone. I was an insomniac. I didn't sleep at all because I was with this twat and he just basically took over my life. And I went seeing this lady and first two sessions... Um, fucking like £75 a session. I just cried. I didn't even speak. I sat there on a couch and I did not say a word. I just was a blubbering mess. And that happened twice. And then the third time I went back, she did a few exercises with me. And hand on heart, she did get... I've, I've never like touched... No, I've had sleeping pills and whatever when I've come back from a beef and stuff like that I can't sleep. But I was addicted. I used to like panic when I saw Zopiclone running out. I'd be like, oh my God, get me to the doctors and like trying to find sleeping pills from anywhere. And I got off the sleeping pills. She completely like taught me how to deal with it. And I started sleeping again. And then we started doing loads of mental exercises that did really, really work. And one thing that she did tell me to do was she told me to write down five things that I wanted to accomplish. It could be anything at all. Don't tell anyone what they are. And I wrote five things down and... um 
like she told me to kiss it and stuff, which when I was doing it, I was like, fuck, I feel like such a freak doing yeah. this. But like put it behind my bed and literally all five things came true within 18 months. But I got certain things like and like physical things, but it's what it did to my head, like was what I was most thankful for. Um, I started to find this ability to um, Visualize. not be angry at him anymore. I wasn't, I started to actually feel sorry for him uh, more than anything. And I hadn't, I couldn't get that ability before then. It was constant, just feeling trapped and like there was no way out. And I started kind of having a complete different outlook on what had happened. Um, so yeah, I thought therapy did work to a certain degree. Extent. Yeah. But again, that's for anybody watching, goal setting, writing, if you write it down, it becomes clearer in your mind. Yeah, it does. So no matter what your dreams are or ambitions, anybody can achieve it. And you can also rewire your brain into changing the way you think. There's a thing called Havening now. Um, I do a thing with a place called Chrissy's House where they change the trauma for a positive thing and they like touch points in your shoulder and stuff and it rewires it and reconnects the brain into a positive way of thinking. I don't care who you are, anybody can change the way you're thinking. And, Absolutely, And it's yeah. difficult because we all think about the past, we all think, okay, if you're getting told you're a fuck up or you're not clever enough, it's going to stick in your mind all the time and it's 10, 20 years, 30 years of trauma. I ain't going to change overnight, five years. It's a, a no, long, steady process. Not. And just because you're not academically clever to sit at a desk who the fuck says you should be sitting at desks anyway no, all your no, life no 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 one tells me i should be sat at a desk it's just no I just would, in general I, yeah i'd like it's just something i'd like to do but i've done the other things that i've done like it's like i've written a book never thought in a million years i'd write a book and the reviews that i've got from that were you know it's only on kindle at the minute and for me to read the reviews that people have put is just absolutely mind-blowing like, I say it on my Instagram stories and stuff, but I don't think I can kind of... I'm a bit shit at kind of expressing emotion, I suppose. But it, I literally sit there and I read everything that people are saying. I'm like, it's it's just so nice to see. These people are strangers. Yeah, it doesn't matter what people think about me. But for someone to take time out of the day, you know, or two days even, whatever it's took to, for them to read the book... For them to sit there and read what I have to say and then take time to put into their own words how they found the book. And they also nail how I wanted it to sound. Like they say it's a roller coaster to read. They laughed. They pissed themselves laughing. At like Or they, they, they cried. It was a roller coaster, blah, blah, blah. That's like a massive accomplishment because I, when I set out to do the book, two other people had written it. And it didn't sound, it was, oh, I, didn't, I just, I didn't like it at all. Like they did a good job, but it, it wasn't, I'm a hard person to write about, I suppose. And I swear a lot and I'm rude and I'm crude and I wanted all that in there and they kind of took that out. So when I kind of, like when I did it myself, I thought I can read these reviews and I can think, you know, a lot of them are all, have all said, I can hear Helen in this book. I, it's like she's reading it to me. And I'm like, I've absolutely nailed that. And that's the best feeling ever when it's coming from, it's weird because the strangers and I feel more asked about what they're saying than, because obviously my friends are going to praise me anyway. My friends have to praise me. Mm -hmm. They've no choice. No. For strangers don't have to praise you. So for someone who doesn't know you from Adam to say, that's a brilliant book. You've done a really good job. And they tell you all the emotions that they felt and they're the emotions you wanted them to feel. That's like, of course I'll give myself a massive course, pat on the back. Yeah, you've got to give yourself enough credit. I don't think people, when they do have great achievements, you probably never thought you'd have wrote a book 20 years ago. Do you know what I mean? You no, have, never. so you've got to give yourself credit. Were you nervous? You're very well, you're out, very outspoken. You're very outspoken. Were you nervous releasing the book? Um, I was, there's stuff in the book that I think a lot of people can relate to and when they read it they'll be like I've been through this and it's really it, I found it difficult to talk about and that's why I had to put it into my own words because actually sitting talking to a ghost writer about it just wasn't doing me any favours so actually writing it did more for me um you so, therapy for yourself I do a wee bit of therapy for yeah. yourself it's stuff that I only told my best friend a few years ago 
um, because it's stuff that I, I didn't ever want to think about ever again. Um, it's stuff that kids shouldn't go through. And for me to write that and put that, you know, put pen to paper, I now know, and it's weird because I never addressed this until I did the book, that because of certain things that, you know, that have happened, that's the reason why I behave a certain way and why I've done certain things, i.e., it, you know, it's called a man's world for a reason. From a young age, you know, it's funny, like I, I did an interview the other week and people automatically go for the prostitute thing. They're like, you know, you were a prostitute, you know, we you not scared and we you not this and we you not that. When you have completely succumbed to the idea of every man that you've ever met or family members that are male are abusive towards you, whether that be physically or mentally, you know, when you when you start to be a prostitute and one man's nasty to you out of a bunch that are actually really nice, it doesn't matter. It goes over your head. So when someone was horrible to me when I was doing that job, I just kind of was like, oh, fuck it. He's one out of just a few that are actually really nice to me. And, you know, the fact that the only nice men that I have, I have actually ever met, like, people, they're really shocked when I say this, and I think a lot of people are quite disgusted, but I found a lot of comfort in what I was doing because they were the first men that had ever been nice to me. Yeah, they were leaving money at the side of the bed, but a lot of them were really nice to me, whereas the men that were meant to actually make me feel protected, and I suppose, in a way, protect me from... A lot of people think that people that use prostitutes are like predators or something. A lot of them are just really normal guys. Um, but the guys that were meant to protect me, i.e. my dad and my boyfriends, like, the, like my, my son's dad and my ex-boyfriend that I was with for years, they are just three men that have caused me the most damage. Heartbreak. Do you think so, that's where the abandonment issues kick in, where you're being a prostitute, people are giving you money, but they're giving you that attention and you're making you feel good? You might feel worthless after it, but at that time you're getting that emotion. I didn't, I didn't feel worthless after it. Did you and block that out? I could, some days I'd come home and I really couldn't deal with what I was doing um, but then I just like, I thought, fuck it. What like, age did you start? I was about 22. And what was the first experience like for you? The first experience, I didn't, you know, that wasn't great. Um, he, he couldn't really, he was an Italian guy. And um, I did feel like shit. And I did another, I felt like shit after it. But then I did another job. I went on an out call. And that's what it was like. It was just. You didn't. You don't have time to think, really. I became a robot. I wasn't Helen. I was never, ever Helen in the job, but probably, like, a couple of times. Like, if I had a drink, which was very, very rare, if I had a wine or something, and then I'd go and see a client, I really relaxed, and I kind of became Helen. Um, but I was such a, I don't know, you do, you, you become like a robot. Everything was robotic from the minute of going into the room with somebody and the minute you leave, um, you just switch off. I just literally had the ability to be a completely different person. I was so false. Like, I'd put on a different, a different voice. I'd have a different voice. Become a character. I'd lie. I'd lie about my home life. I lied about where I came from. You know, I lied about what car I drove. Like, everything kind of... <laughs> Yeah, I just I just talked such a shit. I, I, I wasn't Helen. I was the person that I was called on the website. What was your name on the website? I'd never tell anyone. The name. Shite bag. Never. I'm going to find that name out. We're going to put it everywhere, oh, Steph. <laughs> I think it was like Chris Stahl or Sh Moe. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it weren't, it weren't that bad. So what made you do it then? Obviously, because you had the kid. You, your son was six then. Mm. So what made you... No, he's a bit younger than that. Go so, to that side. I, I was. You a stripper or anything actually, beforehand? Yeah, yeah. I'd been a stripper. I was absolutely shit. I was the worst stripper ever. Who's your name? I don't even remember what my name was. That Diamond. I think it was like Nicole or something. Oh, that's shit. No, I never had anything really tacky. Oh. Even though, like, it was so tacky, but no, I, I was a stripper. I was really, really shit, and um, you know, you 
it's such a, I take my hat off to strippers. That is such a hard job. Like you really, really have to graft for the money. And I just didn't have it in me. I'd end up sitting, chatting shit to one guy and I didn't like how they were. I didn't, I felt so much more degraded stripping, dancing in front of other people, naked, fanny tits out and everything else in front of everyone else to see more. That's when I started to think, you know, because that's when guys, they offer you money. They'd say, do you want to come back to my hotel and stuff? And I was always like, no. And then as time went on, I just thought, this is bullshit. Like, I'm hardly, you don't earn that much money and you're prancing about, you know, you flaps out in front of everyone else's face. Sounds like my kind of party. <laughs> No, it just, it, <laughs> no, I was crap. I was a really crap stripper. Um, and then, anyway, I was working an office job. Um, so I worked in an office and I was doing lap dancing as well. And um, I got I got um, made redundant. Um, they'd made cutbacks in the office, which at the time, you know, I wasn't anything special, but I was, I was kind of working my way up, I thought. You know, I'd became... I was under this accountant's wing. She was t- training me how to do different things. And I really started to feel really good about what I was doing with my life and stuff. I wasn't earning big bucks or anything like that. But I felt like I'd found a bit of a purpose. And I felt like without me, this, you know, this like little dog's body in the room, I didn't care that I was a dog's body. Someone needed me and that was a good feeling. And and then I got I got the boot, which at the time was just like my life crumbled. I thought I took a loan out. I had, you know, I owed rent. My landlord at the at the time was an absolute creep, constantly trying it on with me, asking, you know, you don't have to pay rent if you do this, that, and the other. He knew I was a. He knew I did lap dancing as well. Um. So yeah, obviously, if that kind of thing happened now. I'd bounce back from it. I'd be like, I'd say to my landlord or whatever, you know, having your rent or whatever, or, you know, if I had a loan repayment, I'd say, you're going to have to work because I need to find a job or whatever. But I didn't, I couldn't do that at the time. I just couldn't see the wood for the trees at all. And um, my friend at the time, um, I brought down to her on the phone. I told her like what predicament I was in. And I did kind of like massively over exaggerate it, but it, it felt like really a bad time, a bad thing at the time, um, losing my job as a single mum. I wasn't getting any help. And she suggested, why don't you do escorting? So I was like, would well, you have to like do you have to sleep with them? And she was like, not all of them, but like most. So um she said, Why don't you just do it for a bit? I'm not like as much as I cannot stand um this person that I'm talking about. I'm not saying she forced me into it. She didn't force my hand or anything. Um, She literally, like, my my ears pricked up. I was like, okay, so I can make quick money. I can get out of debt and whatever. So I went for an interview, like, a couple of days later. And um, the lady was just like, yeah, yeah, you can start, whatever. And I said I'd do it for a week until my debts were cleared. And then naturally you see the money rolling in. I could maintain a normal life. I'd quit lap dancing and I could work during the day. So I was still home to pick my son up from school. Um, And then I'd do like the odd job on a weekend or some weeks I wouldn't work at all. Um, And then it just spiralled really because the money became so kind of addictive. It was, it was, I shouldn't say easy money, but... Yeah, how much were you making? The, what was your first, how much did you get paid? Like the first, it was only like 200 quid. It's like 200 quid. Lot. Must have been a fucking yeah. dear one. <laughs> no, they were. I know ones at 40, do you know what I mean? Speed dial, no, Stephen, there's a like, number. It wasn't a brothel. It was, there was an apartment with two bedrooms in it and one or two girls would work from there. And then it was all mainly out calls. You'd just go and, and I was, I'd go and see someone and I'd just chat away keep talking and talking and talking. I kind of got older guys, really. So from, like, 40 onwards, I always got. And I'd just talk and talk and talk. And older guys tend to have a bit more of a story, so they want to talk back with you. And before you knew it, and I was gone. So there's your hour ticked off. And then um, you could get another hour out of them, or I'd just tell you, you'd have a driver that would take you around and whatever. And I'd just 
you know, bump my driver some money. And I'd just tell them to tell the agency, you know, that I'd already gone home. And then you'd end up kind of just staying all night with that person and you'd take all the money. You tend to see, though, a lot of people who go into the stripping industry or prostitution, you tend to see they have got a lot of abandonment issues, daddy issues, and where they're wanting Massively. that. They're kind of wanting that, someone to give them attention. I never knew that at the time. But as I've got older, I know I was searching for something. I know for a fact I was definitely searching for something. Because now I'm, it's gone from one end of the spectrum to the other now. So when I was a lot younger, I was searching for some kind of male protection, some kind of any man being nice to me was was what I wanted. So I went for that. it. Yeah, I clung on to it. Whereas now I do the opposite. Like a man's nice to me and I'm like three texts in and I'm like, fuck that. But he you, likes because me, I don't like it anymore. You know you're worth now. You know you're mm. worth, you know what you deserve and... It's no matter if you're a fucking prostitute, no matter what you are in life, everybody's got different circumstances to make them who they are at that certain moment. That's the moment that probably saved your life. As much as it can be difficult for people looking in, nobody should judge. In life, no. we all fucking make mistakes. Nobody's perfect. You've always been honest and open about your mistakes. And no doubt, listen, you're going to make fucking plenty more mistakes. No Wait, doubt I will. Obviously. So what age did you stop? I only did it for like two years. Didn't do it for long. But that two years, the, in 2011, it came out with the Wayne Rooney stuff. Yeah. And that's what kind of gave you the celebrity status where everybody knew you. It's a celebrity, I'd say yeah, but it did. One of Britain's it, most hated women status. Really Let's, hated? Yeah, I was really hated. Like, so who, who broke... to go out anymore, really. Yeah, who broke the news about the Wayne Rooney stuff? So it all happened. It, we slept with him and... I knew straight away, getting in the lift after we'd slept with him, I knew I knew my relationship with her was finished. I could just, the smirk on her face, I could see the clogs, you know, turning in her head. And I started to arse lick her, started to tread on eggshells. And, you know, I became everything that I'm not as a person. I really did start to, re I had my tongue up her ass, thinking I really need her to not go to the papers. I could just see it in her though. And a few months later, the press came. I'd gave her a wide berth. I'd met my boyfriend, who I didn't want him to find out what I'd been doing. And um, I didn't want him to know that I'd slept with him anyway. I ended up, I did obviously tell him what I'd done for a job. But cut a long story short, the journalist came knocking and whatever. I told him to fuck off and they listened first time. And then they came back a year later and... Um, well, a year, a year after it had happened, and uh, they just weren't taking no for an answer. And I I was like, how can they print something if they've not got proof? That's what I had in my head. And Jenny swore blind that, you know, I'm not going to say your name, I'm not going to say your name. But all along, all these texts I was sending her, she was showing the journalist. So that was my admission. I didn't think on my feet at the time. Well, it wasn't that I didn't think on my feet at the time. I didn't realise someone could be that fucking horrible. I'm saying to her, if that got out and everyone finds out, you know, that what I used to do, I'll literally kill myself. I can't have I can't have my son go through that. Like it'd finish me. And she was like, babe, don't worry, I wouldn't do that to you and all this. And all along she was showing the journalists, me begging her. She showed her like she turned her phone off, she fucked off to Marbella, switched her phone off. And I was sending her messages through Facebook just saying, like, her friend actually gave me the tip-off that she was sat with journalists. And um, I was messaging her on Facebook saying, like, I know you're with them. Please tell me that they don't know anything about me. And she was just like, I can't talk, Helen. I can't talk. That's all she kept putting back to me. And um, it was just horrible. Like, I just don't know how someone can do something like that. But, you know... She has her reasons for being what, you know, the cold, horrible person that she is. And I've learned to deal with that. Um, but yes, yeah, so she was showing the journalists what I was saying. So I was fucked basically. Because I then, through a mutual friend of mine and Wayne's, um, I was saying to him, I'll go to court and I'll lie. I'll say that we got to the room and you didn't want to do it. You shouldn't have done it anyway because she's gone around telling everyone, oh, that we had this brilliant time in the bedroom and that he was buzzing. No, he wasn't buzzing at all. Like, And that's shameful for me to even admit. I don't know why he did it because 
he didn't seem to me like he enjoyed it. Like he chatted and whatever, but he was uncomfortable. He was uncomfortable with what he'd done. I I think he was anyway. Um, I think he already knew that he was balls deep in shit when that happened. And um, she, obviously she painted this amazing picture that we'd had a threesome with a footballer and it wasn't anything like that. Um, anyway, derail from what I was saying now, what I was saying. So hot taxis. Yeah. So she showed. So that's it. I was liaising with with one of Wayne's mates. I was saying, I'll tell Colleen and I'll tell the court that yeah, it, we did go to the hotel, um, but it didn't happen. You know, you 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 shit it when we got there. Whatever. I don't think anybody would have believed that anyway. Mm, I know, but it would have been my word again. We could have always said, you know, at the time, James, I was desperate. I was trying anything. I was thinking, I'll do anything to believe it or not. I didn't want to hurt her. And I didn't want to hurt him. You know, he'd not really, he'd not done anything to me. But as soon as I went for meetings with his legal team, and when I went there, they basically looked me up and down and they thought I was there to blackmail them for money. And they were like, well, what do, what do you want for all this? You know, I was like, what? And they went, so you want to keep your name at the paper? Like, what do you want? What are you going to gain from that? I went, you think I'm here for money? I'm not. I don't fucking want anything. Just stop my name from coming out. And they asked me to sign this um, this piece of paper, like this form with all bits and bobs on it. And um, I ran it by a really good barrister that I know. And he said, because uh, I said, can I just take this form out and whatever, so I rang my friend up and I told him, and he went, do not sign that piece of paper. He said, because they're going to go to court, Helen, and the judge is going to throw the book at Wayne because he's no doubt been fucking around with other people. And if you throw the book at Wayne, you can't make a single penny off it and your name will be everywhere. And I was like, but I don't want to sell it. He went, I know that, but put that to one side. He said, you're going to have to forget about that for a second. He went, because if the shit hits the fan, then... You know, you're going to have to do something. You're going to have to basically make something from it. So I started to panic then. He said, anyway, he said, don't sign the paper. I didn't. I've gone back in the room. I said, you're going to have to take my word for it. I'm not going to the press. I'm not going to talk to the press. But I'm not signing that piece of paper until I know what happens in court with Wayne. I've agreed to lie. You know, I'm, I'm, I'd happy, happily go and stand in court and, and you know, lie as well. That's fine. Anyway, Day after, I think it was the day after or the day after that, and um, they, I got told off a journalist that he'd not been granted the injunction and that I would be in the paper the next day, well, 12 o'clock that night. So... So who was your head then? I just, I actually, I don't know, I can't even... There was just no... I don't know, just panic... Straight panic. Suicidal thoughts. Yeah. Like, I fucking hate that I'm doing this. It's okay. Like, the fact that people think for a second that I ever wanted that. How girls go out and plan to ruin someone's life and sleep with someone and think, I'm going to sell this story. I have no idea. So, I've got over the fact that everyone knew what I'd done for a job. What I've never got over is the fact that people think I set out to hurt people. I never did that. So the fact that, like, I got told that I was going to be, thank you, that I was going to be known as that, um, it was just I couldn't stop thinking about my kid. I just thought I've ruined his life. Obviously, I haven't ruined his life. Like, we've got the best relationship ever. But taking it back to that point, I'll never get over that feeling of knowing that I was going to be known as that. And I couldn't even look. I couldn't, like, obviously, I just, I ran away. I went staying at my friend's house. I locked myself in his spare room. I just couldn't come out. Like, because the press were everywhere. So I had to hide. And um, I was told to stay away from my son because they chased me and stuff like that. And they did. They were outside his school. Like, it was just fucking awful. And um, I didn't see him. I didn't see my son for, like, over a week. And do you know what? I couldn't even... I couldn't even look him in the eye, even when I did see him. 
he didn't have a clue. He had no idea what I'd done. But I just couldn't, I couldn't get get my head around how I had been so selfish because that's how it turned out. I started to think, what the fuck have I done? Like, yeah, no one knew about it. I was living this secret life. And then all of a sudden I became this really selfish person and I'm actually not a selfish person. So to deal with that, that feeling of thinking because of my actions, I've wrecked my kid's life, I've hurt a woman that never deserved to be hurt and, you know, it wasn't about bringing shame on my family because I didn't give a shit about my family. You know, my best friend, like, she was pregnant and stuff and those who have a really, really good best friend like what I had, she was pregnant, she went into labour with the news. So she went into labour and then the day after it came out, you know, she had she had my godson and I, I didn't see him for, like, over a week, which to some people, people would be like, you know, a big fucking deal and whatever, but she'll never know how much because she doesn't, she's not programmed like me and she doesn't appreciate the things that I had at the time, like a best friend, like a son. She has a child now, so I'd like to think she wasn't such a cold-hearted bitch, but she probably still is. But, you know, at the time, when all that's going on, you just... I couldn't see a way out. I couldn't see a way out, and my, it took my friends to say, you need to get out of bed and make some money and stop feeling sorry for yourself. It wasn't that I felt sorry for myself. There's a big difference between feeling sorry for yourself and I didn't see the point in being alive anymore. It can be difficult for you. People looking from the outside don't understand your upbringing, first of all, and then being this character and putting on that act, doing that for two years, you blocked it out, but then it eventually came to the surface and then you probably looked at it and done, what the fuck am I doing with my life? It's probably yeah. made sense. And as much as you can say, married men are coming this and that, it takes two, it always takes two. Always takes You've got two, to yeah. also take responsibility for your actions, the same as, that's what the I same did. as Wayne that's, as well. That's what I did. And, and like when people, when a lot of people try and defend me, and obviously I'm grateful for people defending me, but the worst thing that anyone could ever say is, well, you weren't the one that's married, so it's not your fault. And I go, no, don't don't say that. I still did something wrong. Like I can't say I didn't do. I I can't say that I wasn't part to blame because I was. So when people do kind of jump to my defence and say that, I very quickly say, no, I'll I'll never say I didn't do something wrong because I did. And you know, after it, I turned very, I turned really, really bitter, and I was again very, very angry at the world and stuff. And yeah, I did sell my side to the story, but I sold it a week later after I'd basically spent a week in bed being sick and feeling like shit and feeling like there wasn't really any point in going on. And it, everything did come to the surface. I remember lying there thinking, like, you just a massive, massive fuck up. And you've not only fucked up like your life, it was more what I'd done to it's more what I'd done to my son really, because I'd been selfish. That's what it. That was the hard thing to grasp was thinking because of my actions, my selfishness, what I chose to do for a job, I've now damaged other people, and that's what you know I really found hard to bear. Yeah, everything has a ripple effect. So if you're doing bad yeah, stuff massively. and you might not see it, and I've got a lot of friends in the porn industry who've been on this podcast and they will block it out and you will become a character but you take the cameras away you take the prostitution away it's still you're still doing an act of because if someone's married or and they're coming to you then it has a ripple effect on that side of the family obviously people need to look at it for your side you've got your kid your upbringing but then you look have you ever spoke to a colleen or is there ever any messages or was it just no, no, I'd never, I'd never like, I'd never speak to like the press were vile. Like when it all happened, like they were really pushing for us to. They'd find out where she was on nights out, and they were offering like thousands for us to go, you know. And Jenny went to Liverpool. She was out somewhere in Liverpool, and like, um, the the press were like, "Oh, so we found out where she is. Would you go in there?" And I was like, "What the fuck is wrong with you people?" Like, why would I do that to someone? And, you know, she did go there. She went on a night out and loads of her friends fucking chased her down the street, like throwing the shoes at her and stuff like that. And 
I just uh, I just can't get my head around like why you'd actually want to add salt to the wounds. So people obviously say will still say no. So why are you still talking about it if you don't want to hurt her? I don't talk about that. My book's about everything, and that's why I've done the book. So when people say, oh, "But you're dragging it up," well, two things: I don't ever drag it up. People drag it up to me. This was ten years ago. This was ten years ago, and there's. It's very rare that I go 24 hours on social media without say it, seeing a comment about what I used to do or a comment about that family. So it's all right for the public to bring it up, but I'm not all right to defend bring closure yourself. on it. I'm not, well, I don't really, I don't defend it. Like there's nothing to defend, but I'm not allowed to bring closure to it by writing a book and by proving that that, that thing, that tiny, tiny snippet of my life is insignificant. Where anyone who reads the book, someone wrote a belting review last week. They said, this book is not about Wayne Rooney. In fact, it's anything but about Wayne Rooney. It's about everything else and it's really opened my eyes to what life's really like for some people. And I thought that's exactly like what I want people to see. It's only very small-minded people that are like, oh, if you don't write a book on Wayne Rooney, and I'm like... Well, actually, no, because I don't want people to fucking fall asleep. There's nothing really for me to write about him. I've only, I've I've written a book because I've been stigma. I've had this stigma now for ten years, and I'll probably have it for another ten about something that I used to do and and something you know who I did it with. Um, and I'm hoping that the book and more people that read it will actually never look at me in that light again. Do you regret that night with Wayne Rooney? Um, yeah, I'd say I regret doing that with him, but have I? has there been a silver lining after it? Yeah. Like lots of good things have happened since that. It's changed your life, but again, in 2011, you're also attacked. Was that because of everything that came out in the yeah. press? Yeah, that, came, that happened because of what had happened. Um, that's what I mean. It wasn't a safe place to go out anymore. I wasn't safe to go out anywhere. Became a hermit. I couldn't leave the house because of it. Because as much as I'm a confident person, at the time, because obviously I felt guilty of what had happened, and I'm not this, you know, cold, horrible person that walks around, you know, thinking that I'm constantly in the right and I've done nothing wrong. I was the total opposite. I just found it easier to stay in and avoid places because people just hated me for what I'd done. And, you know, especially women. Like, I was I was scum of the earth to to, to married women especially. It was a few broke up a married a yeah, yeah. family home. And you can understand where they're coming from, but to act Absolutely, violent yeah, towards yeah. you is, is not right. I think, you know, five girls on one accompanied by one of the dads. Um, you know, it was a bit much, really. I can understand a girl walking over and giving me a smack, but five girls to do that to one person and then the dad record it, you know, I don't think anyone deserves that. Definitely not. How did he make contact with the... Was it an agency or was it you personally, direct? How did the contact with Wayne um, come about? It was, it was from a night out, yeah. Just, and it was only one time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how did that... Moving forward for your life then, when did you realise that this wasn't for you to be a prostitute, an escort, whatever name you I want to give someone. it? I met yeah. someone. I met someone and um, I started to feel really bad. Like I um, I don't know why I felt bad though because he was up to God knows what. Well, I know what he was up to. He was seeing his ex at the time and I was doing that and it kind of just worked. I thought, he's lying, I'm lying, fine. Like I don't know if I'm going to get with him properly. Um but then when I really, really started to like him, I just thought, I can't do this. This is shit. Like, so I just told him what I did. And then I just quit. I just stopped what I was doing. I just said, I'll go and get a normal job. But that's, see, again, that's one of the worst things I ever did. I stopped. I went and got another job. And I was so skint because he never paid for anything. And because I told him what I used to do, he kind of started to look down on me and he changed towards me a bit and all of a sudden everything that I earned was going into running a house and I didn't have a life anymore. I never had any spare money and 
he got a kick out of me saying, can I have some money for this? Which I've, makes my fucking toes crunch now saying it. Like, I hate that I was ever, I ever needed him. Like, I ever needed to ask him for money, but he didn't pay his way. It was it always abusive relationships you were in? I've only ever had one proper boyfriend. My son, my son's dad. <laughs> How long was that? It was like four years. I was, you know, I can't sit here and say that it was all him because it wasn't. I'm fully aware of what I'm like as a person. I'm a wind up merchant, and I know how to, I knew how to push his buttons. Um, but it was just to it was toxic. It was toxic on both parts. Like he he took the piss with money. He'd take the piss staying out. You know, not coming home and stuff like that. So I do things back. It was just tip for tat, but. It was the mind games with him and the, oh, just like, he was just very nasty in what he'd say and stuff. He was very critical of like appearance and he, you know, but then he soon changed his tune when he went to jail. All of a sudden, you know, I was the, I was the person that he needed and. Getting used. Yeah, I got used. I was basically someone to, you know, I was a. I was his base. I, I was just a port. I was there for um, postal orders and someone to go and visit. And, you know, that's it. It feels as if you've been used and abused your whole life, Ellen, but it's good to see you eventually taking the reins because no matter what you've been through, you've got your shit together. You went on to Big Brother in 2014 yeah. and you absolutely fucking smashed it. And it shows you that even though in your mind sometimes that people might be judging you, it clearly shows that you're liked as well. You're very well outspoken, like I've said earlier, but you won the show. Yeah, How did that experience been, come for you? I loved it. I absolutely loved going on it. It was brilliant. And when I came off, um, the response from people, it, it was weird, really, like going like without going back too far. But when I was a kid, because when, you, when you're used to people not being very nice to you, you don't know how to deal with people being really nice to you. So, like, when I was a kid, like, I didn't like parties or anything like that. I didn't like everyone being nice to me. I'd, like, cry and, you know, react really oddly to it. And I still do it at this age. Like, I couldn't deal with how nice the public would be in. I found it very, very uncomfortable. I'd rather someone want to pick a fight with me and debate with me than someone actually want to That's because you've been me. fighting your whole life. Yeah. So when people were actually dead nice to me, and like I came out and I met like some of the housemates' families and stuff, and they were literally like so nice and so loving and stuff like that. And the nice things that was said, I, Big Brother did a massive thing for me in respect of it taught me how to start blocking out like really shit comments. And I started to really like pick up on the nice stuff and really run away with the nice stuff. So Although I didn't respond to a lot of the nice comments because I felt like a dick when, you know, when someone's really nice to you on Twitter and they send something really sweet and whatever, I, I just, like, like it. But if someone called me a slag or whatever, I'd be like, rah! It's like, because you're, jump you're, on it. you're used to that defence yeah. mechanism. But if someone was, like, dead nice, I'd just be like, yeah, I'll just favourite that comment. I won't actually, like, say anything dead nice back. Um, but deep down, I was like, that's so nice, you know, someone to say. Yeah. But it did me massive favours in that respect that, I started to really notice the good and I really started to pay attention to really nice people and block out really shitty people who didn't didn't have any interest in liking me. Yeah. Well, Big Brother, it gave you the opportunity to show your character and show that you're not a fucking wrong and this and that and what the press can make out in black and white, people what people read stick. So it was good for you to get the opportunity and then when you, people start liking you and you want to show, then it gives you the confidence that you're not a bad person, getting told for 20 odd years that you're a waster or you can't do this and that, and then you just prove everyone wrong. And it goes to show that no matter what you fucking do in life, you can also make good of it. You can also progress from it. One Big Brother wrote your book, sitting across from me. Life's fucking good. Huh? Life's fucking good. I've nailed it. Uh, uh, don't <laughs> use that word. <laughs> um, so after Big Brother, how was life then? Fine. Um, I didn't do the typical strike while the iron was hot. I was advised to be in London and go around with people that were on reality TV and mingle as much as I could, basically go to the opening of a fucking envelope, do it all. And I didn't. I came back and 
that was it. I just, I turned my back on it all. I didn't have anything to do with anything. Um, Were you scared? Of what? Going in the limelight. All the maybe negative. No, I just met a lot of... Wankers. Yeah, it wasn't for me. I did a couple of, I did a couple of events and I just, I started to think, Helen, you need to take responsibility for the positions you put yourself in. And I'm not someone that can be in a room with people that I don't like and not say anything. So it just kind of made sense for for me to not go. Um, I went to one um, one event, which was quite amusing, really. So I I did really well with my online column. Like, I think I was like one of the most successful ones that they had at the Daily Star. So um, lots and lots of people read it. But I also wrote about a lot of people. and I went to this one event and um, everyone that was in the room, I'd basically told them a new arse all in my um, columns. And I was like, those drinks are free. Mm-hmm. I'm going to drink them all. So I drank about 25 porn star martinis. I was fucked. And I was just sat in the corner on my own. And I just thought this literally just sums up why I don't really fit in in this world because... I did sit, I was like, so I think, that, oh, there was one, girl, uh, Chloe Lewis off Tower. She spoke to me. She was lovely. Actually, the most beautiful girl in the room with the most nicest personality as well. So down to earth. But everybody else, I just thought, I did sit there watching them and I thought, I'm really trying hard to, you know, understand why people come to these things, but I can't really get my head around it. And I just ended up pissed. It's fake as fuck. So as it's all an illusion, people yeah. might look at the outside and think. And do you know it's what? A great pe- life. Do you know what people don't realise is, like, I'm not going to name names because that's not fair. But Shape, I know a lot of people in the limelight who are absolutely, you know, they just sniff coke every day. They're really depressed. They're not very happy people. They're really stuck up their own ass because they've now got a blue tick. But then you see them on Instagram and I'm like, you fake fuck. (laughs) You're not that person. I've been in the room with agents where, you know, these people are ringing them up, demanding, pay for this room, do this, do that. I need this. I'm not going there. And I'm like, I could never be an agent. I'd be like, go and fuck yourself. Like, sort yourself out. And But then obviously I see the people on Instagram and I'm like, that is like, that's some talent, that, to put that show on when that's not you. It's like personality. Mm. So it is. And yeah, I see a lot through the bullshit as well. And again, that's the society we're in. We live in a social media world where we can fake with life. But when you see these people yeah. and you see the cracks and you go, oh, wait a minute, that's bullshit. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? We'll touch on the, sorry for going back to it, but the girl, Janie Thompson, was a girl who exposed that, but yeah, she's in the papers yesterday saying you're calling her hairy nipples and mm-hmm. this and that, but how she saying you're bringing it to the surface was it was her that started that? Oh, well, exactly. Well, she doesn't like the fact that all of a sudden, 10 years on, I decided to tell, you know, it's not about this, and the book's not about that, but she's saying I'm dragging it up. If she actually had two brain cells to rub together, I would advise her to read the book. I'm not even sure if she can read though, to be honest. But how can we get the book first of all? Ah shit! Why have I not brought a copy? Fuck! You dirty bastard! I've not brought a copy. What a bell end! I've got loads in my. We'll put pictures up anyway. How can people buy the book first of all? Um, so it's available on Kindle for now, but it's also going to be on um the shelves. And Amazon are driving me mad. I can't give a date out because it should be this week. Um, but it will be out like this week. Good. Um, but yeah, yeah, she's she's saying I'm bringing it up and whatever. She did the whole, every time I do something, I went on Big Brother and she went on Big Brother and said I, I used to bully her and it's like, why did you hang around with a bully? Are you sure I bullied you? Or was I the person that, you know, I was the shoulder that you cried on because you knew your life was just as much of a mess as mine, but I could deal with it slightly better. We were both very similar people in that way. She was very fucked up. I was very fucked up. But yeah, she tried. She's tried everything. Um, she she went on. Um, I don't even really want to talk about it, to be honest, because that's what she loves. But yeah, every every time I've done something, she's gone on big. She's gone on TV, and you know, Helen's not a nice person. This that and the other. Well, if you were, you know, she she said that I was a bully. 
well, if I was that much of a bully, why did you go to the newspapers knowing, why would you sell information on a bully if I was that much of a bully? Was there a lot of jealousy came your way when you won Big Brother? Um, do you know what? The most stick I got from anywhere was my hometown. So people often say like, why do you hate Bolton so much? Why do you live there if you don't like? I'm like, do you know what? Bolton isn't that much of a bad place, but it's a very small place with a lot of small-minded people in it. So when I go to a city or I, I go abroad, I don't face the knobheads. Now, if I go out in Bolton and I go to a restaurant in Bolton or the the pubs where all the clicks go, then I can guarantee something would start. There would be there'd be some kind of kickoff because people just have chosen never to get over things that I've done. Yeah. Um, so I just divide them places. It's just easier. But there's no nobody gives you criticism if they are doing well with their own life. They're always beneath you. People who criticise and point fingers and judge. You'll see it even on Twitter, man. You get people who have got profile pictures of football players or cartoon characters just talking shit. Mm. For me, that's the worst kind of people. So yeah, it's always yeah. the same people. I yeah. always get trolled by um, like there's a woman who you know. She, she I've blocked I've ended up blocking her now because I was so bored of seeing her shit. But every time I go abroad, she'd like write under my pictures, Why are you not at home with your son? And I just, <laughs> I just wind people up. I'm like, oh, he's fucking fine on his own. I've left him with some Finders pancakes and mm-hmm. you know, he's got a fiver on the side. I'm like, you fucking prick, like you're so bored in your life. And she she oh, I'm at home with them, I'm at home with my kids. I'm like, fucking go and clean some shitty asses then and get off my case. I don't care. Like, this is the thing. And then I've said things to this woman, and then people have said, Oh, you shouldn't say things like this because of mental health. And I'm like, fuck yourself. Mm-hmm. If someone wants to come for me like that, I'm yeah. not, I don't care. Like, I care about mental health. But don't sit there for a second. I'll always stick by this. If you go for some for someone, if you pursue someone and you are going to be a dick and you're going to say things that are going to rattle someone's cage, don't act the victim when that person comes back and rattles yours a lot more. Yeah. But again, you're try, not a victim. You're try, not. You've not got mental health issues. Yeah. You're not depressed. You're not. Don't come that crap because you don't like how someone's responding yeah, to your people shit. People are using words now, racist, fascist, fucking mental health. I am sick of it. I'm sick health, of it. Just down again. But be careful and don't give your energy away too much because where your focus goes, your energy flows. Yeah, and no. You've got that defence mechanism where you're constantly defending. Fuck them. That's what. That's one thing I've got used to. I don't. I don't do it off. I don't actually do it. I don't do it off. <laughs> Every twenty minutes. I, I like to. I like to kind of use witty responses now because it just winds people. Yeah. I had some woman from Australia sent me five messages last week on Instagram. So I read them all and I was just like, "What a weird person!" And I just put, "Do you want a signed copy of my book?" And she was like, "You're a fucking dog. Do you know that you're gonna get everything you deserve?" I was like, you're in Australia. Like, what are you doing? Mm. Like, there's so much to do in Australia, I would imagine. Probably a lot more than Bolton. And here's me not giving a shit what anyone else is doing. But she's in Australia on my Instagram, doesn't yeah. follow me. She's sat there reading articles about me. Jealousy. I was like, wow. But trolls need to understand. Just get a lie. They're the biggest fucking cowards in the world. These are the ones who are doing nothing with their life. They're absolute wasters. If you're doing so well with your life, you don't need to try and judge others. You don't need to judge I don't others. Judge, I don't judge anybody. Like, um, I met someone recently, actually, um, and he sent me a message. Um, I met him in a really weird weird situation. Anyway, something happened with the police, and he sent me a message the other day saying, I don't know whether you'd want to hear from me still, but I have got a bit of a colourful past, blah, blah, blah. And I just said, don't justify yourself to me. As long as you're not a paedophile or a murderer, I'm not asked. Like... I'm not bothered. Like, don't justify. I'm, I would never ever go off the whole or oh, what someone's done as a past. Like, you can't. <laughs> that, nobody why, can. Though. Do you know what I mean? Everybody's nobody, got a past. Nobody can, but me more than mm-hmm. ever. I'm fully aware of that, and I'd never, I'd never, I'd never deny that. Of course, I'm the last person that could ever look at someone and think. But I wouldn't be. I wouldn't put yourself down too fucking much. You've no, done that. You've done for a couple I'm, of years. Fuck sake. I'm not putting myself down. But I think because I am known because of it, like a lot, a, the difference with, between me and other people is everyone knows what I've done. Um, whereas everyone fucks up and no one really knows about it. Mm-hmm. 
-hmm. A lot of people can just brush things under the carpet. What was the actor? Who did you sign a what's that called? A fucking what's that agreement? Don't say his name, you're gonna get me No, what was the agreement? What's the agreement? Super injunction, I didn't even read it. What is that? A gagging order? Yeah. Why the fuck would they call it a gagging order? I don't know, because that sounds quite So is that what, true then but, about an actor? Yeah, that's true, but um I didn't um I didn't read it because what happened was I was under Max Clifford at the time and I sang like a canary when I went to him and I you know I told him like how shit everything had been with the Wayne Rooney thing and he said, You do understand that you now talking about Wayne Rooney, if you've had any other clients, they're gonna be quite scared that you're gonna sell information and I was like well, I'm not going to. I'm not going to do that, blah, blah, blah. And, oh, God, like a knob. I fell right into his trap. He was like, if you, is there anyone that's, like, quite high profile? So I told him. And this is how he used to make his money. He's gone back to that person who is a lot more well-known and bigger than me and has a lot, lot more money than me. Um, Massive legal team behind him. He's gone and acted like... Basically, like, he was doing them a favour. He was like, Helen's planning on tell selling a story. So they just slapped an injunction on me like that. Was there a lot of celebrities? So I came out again. Was there a lot of celebrities, a lot of high-profile names? Used no, to come to really, it was mainly just, it was sports. Yeah, football players. Mm. They bastards, those football players. Yeah, it's mainly footballers. And... So what's the script then for going forward for the future now? 2019, what's the plans for Helen Woods? Wood. I, it's um, a great second name, by the way, for your old job. <laughs> isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah. Wood by name, wood by name. <laughs> um, I think uh, there's lots of things I want to do. Um, I've got lots of ideas, but I'm one of those that I'd rather just keep it to myself one. in case. Give me one. Like, I'd really like to do something in fashion. Why don't you? Well, I already am. I've already kind of got the ball rolling in, in that world, but... Things are kind of a bit difficult at the minute because I care for my mum and um, that's kind of put the things on the back burner at yeah. the minute. So I think things are going to be changing with her needs in the next 12 months. So what's so. up with your mum just now? She's got Alzheimer's. Sorry to hear that. So um, she's with me like four nights a week. Mm -hmm. um, so things have just slowed down a bit because we haven't got very long left with her until she goes into a home. Um, so I'm just kind of taking it out for now. I've got the time to take out. Um, I slowed down with work. I don't travel as as much with work anymore so that I can do this, which... Priorities. Yeah. Um, so for the next like few months, that's going to be kind of the main thing. But I've got to crack on and do other things because, you know... Money doesn't just grow on trees. So I've got to kind of make still work it, yeah. and do other things as well. But now that you've got the book out. I don't make fuck all from that. No, I've got 5,000 copies I've got to sell before I make a pet. Right, well, we'll we'll Skip after this, we'll fucking sell those, don't worry. Oh, so, so you've wrote the book. What about trying to make it into maybe a documentary, a film? Mm. There's other things in the pipeline. I'd love to do something like that. Do you know that. what I mean? I'd love to do something like that. I'd love to... Um, I don't know. I'd really like to kind of give something back because I have bounced back from it. As much as I've sat here and sounded like the most depressed individual ever, I'm actually really not. And I'd like to use coming out of the other side of a very shitty situation and helping people that need help. I naturally want to help people now, whereas I never used to want to be like that. And I find a lot of you know, when I talk to people who message me on Instagram, a lot of people email me. I find a lot of enjoyment and fulfillment, like speaking back to these people and thinking this may be, you know, I didn't have this years ago because I never reached out and spoke to anyone because I didn't think there was anything wrong with me. So when people actually do come and speak to me about things and take the time out to trust me with what they're saying, you know, I kind of, find that a blessing, really, and I want to do something with that in the long run. Of course it is, um, because you became stronger, a, a much stronger person through all yeah. your pain, 
and you've used you've utilized it to your advantage so again listen people might sl- say things about you about being a prostitute but i know plenty of girls out there who are sucking dick to get their fake rolexes I, and their trucks oh to God, dubai this is what i talk this you know is what, what i, I mean? say so, all the time like when people say things like i don't have an issue whatsoever with women going out being prostitutes and whatever obviously naturally i wouldn't have a problem but what I do have a problem with is I don't have problems with women that just want to go out and actually I do. I think it's really, really shit that a lot of women, I know a lot of women that are in relationships because they wouldn't dare leave because their lifestyle had changed. So you're a glorified brass. Mm-hmm. You get in, <laughs> you get in bed with a guy, mm-hmm. you shag a guy who you don't really love, but you paint this pretty picture that you love. You slag him off nonstop to your friends but you like the watch, you like the red soles, and you like the fucking car you're driving. And without him, you haven't got it. So you're funding a lifestyle. So yeah. that's the form of prostitution yeah, as well. It's, it's, it's the only thing is some people admit it and don't have a problem with it. Like I didn't, I didn't have a problem with it. I don't have a problem with it still. Um, but you always find they're the judgy ones are the ones that kind of are in very like, yeah, look denial. Yeah, yeah, they're yeah, in yeah. denial of the fact that mm-hmm. they're living something quite mm-hmm. similar. When was the last time anyone ever offered you money? For sex? Yeah. Happens quite a lot. Does it? Yeah. Bastards. Yeah. Not for sex, but for like, get a lot of money pigs asking you for, like if you can do stuff. No yeah, weird shit? Yeah. Like what? Like for socks and knickers. <laughs> Which you've been doing it during the night, Stephen. Oh, you've got a fetish for socks and pants. For, 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 for like socks, knickers, for abuse. The amount of men that love being verbally abused. That would be a dominatrix. Mm-hmm. I've known a dominatrix and she fucking I loves know that. someone, Just yeah. dominant fucking Because it's not, it's not actually sex. You're just, just ripping the shit out of a guy. Fuck yeah. at them. Yeah. So before we finish up, we'll touch on the book again. So, writing the book, did it bring back a lot of emotions for you? Yeah, I didn't like, uh, even though I've just cried in this, I didn't cry writing the book, though. Um, it did, and it played, like, a lot of it played on my mind. But I'm really glad that I've done it because it's not good to harbour stuff. It's better to get things out, and that's what I've done. Um, yeah, it's it's a good book. It's, it's called A Man's World, but it's actually really suitable for men to read because of the stories that are in it some of it's funny like it's not doom and gloom there's a lot of stuff in there that is really funny and i've not left any single stone unturned like everything's in there to the point where i was like typing it and then going delete and then typing again and i was like fuck it get it all in there i've got to i've got to get it all in yeah why well, fucking hate so, film it do you know what i mean you can't have a biography and it not be a biography exactly you've got to Listen, there's going to be people who give it the sh- sh- shit she says that, but fuck it, man. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. would you ever do a follow-up? A, bi- a biography? Uh, fucking hell, there be nothing else to write about. Listen, you're, like, you're still young. No, you're only 36, no, fuck's sake. No, I don't think... I do what I want to write. I, I want to write um, an erotic book. Aye? Yep. I'd love to do something like Fifty Shades of Grey, but mine would be better. Mm. Mm. That was amateur. <laughs> Is um what so your column as well? Mm. What was your column about? Everything. It was really good. So I only got a six week contract, and then they kept me on for like three years. Mm-hmm. So that was booming. It did really, really well. But it was about everything. I think because I am very honest and don't have a problem with writing about things to do with myself. That's one of the reasons why it had to come to a head, though, because I'd signed the contract to do a book, and I thought. Fucking hell, it's not even going to be anything left for me to write in the book. I need to like slow down. Mm-hmm. Um, and like papers were losing money and stuff. And so, yeah, papers yeah. are fucked now. Yeah. So, um, but no, it was really good. That was like, that did me a lot of favors as well. The column, don't get me wrong, I had a lot of people going absolutely mental at me on a weekly basis. But again, I just ran away with all the good stuff. Like, mm-hmm. People loving the columns and saying, when I finished, the amount of people that were like really, really gutted that I'd finished. Um, do you ever get back into it? Doing a column? I'd love to. I'd, I'd like to do like a blog or something. I think I'd like to do a vlog more than anything. I like to talk as well. So why don't you do a podcast then? Set a podcast up yeah, for yourself? I'd like to do. I know it's getting people on though. Listen, I've got plenty of contacts. I'll give you a few of mine. 
get you started. Yeah, I yeah, think... You think that, you're playing with a lot of people, and by a lot of people listening to your story, it's something you should maybe dip your toe into, because there's not many yeah. female podcasters out there. Their shows are shit, so there's a massive market for you to maybe get it in, speak to women, and just fucking shoot the shit, man. Speak about life, speak about everything that you've just spoke about there, because people are going to be watching this and not really understanding your story, and then it makes sense and go, fuck me, she's a lot stronger than what she is. Cause because sitting here and telling your story, it's brave, man. It's very brave. And then to be being fo- involved in your life, everything you've went through, winning Big Brother, writing your book, raising a son, single parent, you've not shied away from the fact that you've had a fucked up relationship. You've not shied away from the fact that you're a bit fucked up yourself. But everybody is. I think everybody is in one way yeah, or another. Million percent. Very few people have it like yeah. absolutely perfect, do they? Um I mean, what even is perfect? There's doesn't no such exist. Thing. It's an illusion. No such yeah, thing as perfect. Doesn't exist. But as always, I think it's really. I think it's a lot more damaging to portray a perfect lifestyle. Like I did a question and answer thing the other day on Instagram, and a lot of people were talking to me about my mum. And I thought I need to be honest here, because um, people were saying you're amazing, you're this, that, and the other. Listen, some days, you know, my mum threw a shoe at me the other week and told me to fuck off and stuff like that. And for a split second, I looked at her and I thought, you were a shit mum, you were a shit person. And I had to leave, I had to go in the back garden. I went in the garden and had a fag because I felt anger towards her. She's ill. She's got Alzheimer's. And But for a second, I looked at her and I thought, fuck you. Yeah. Like I got really angry and, and, and I did answer the question and I said, I might paint some days that like I've got everything sussed, but I really don't. Like some days... I have to ring carers and say, I need extra help. And I have to ring and say, I need an extra day because I can't be arsed with her. I can't be arsed with the disease. I don't understand the disease. This is some days, not all the time. The majority of the time, I massively, massively empathise with what's going on in her head. But some days I can't because I'm not a bloody expert on it. Yeah. But um, I think that's important to admit that. And I, and I admitted that on the thing the other day, I thought, whoa, do I give off this impression that I'm some like Florence Nightingale because I'm not. I'm but you really, don't really like, not. again, that comes back to the thing where people don't, you don't like people being nice to you. If you get a gift, you'd probably make shitty jokes. Do you know what I mean? You probably oh, I wouldn't ex- do that. No, but, but you probably, make, no, but you probably but, wouldn't accept it because you think. Yeah, I don't, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't, I'm not someone that could ever take a gift very easily, no. I've never really had it. So for me to start getting it would be very weird for me. Yeah, but. Listen, we're here. We're here to tell the tale. Anything you'd like to finish up on? Uh, no, just buy my book, please. Yeah, we'll get the links and all the subscriptions. Check the link below to buy the book. Fucking great girl, great story, and all the best for the future. Thank you. Keep out of trouble. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, as you're well. welcome.